Hello, everybody. Welcome. My name is Michael Dexter, and I have been working with various containment and virtualization things for quite some time now. And I've tried to find a healthy balance between high-level points, code technical points, and raw information. So this will be a bit of a fire hose. Uh, I hope that will mean there's something for everybody. So put on your seatbelts. <laughs> Let's begin. And you are welcome to interrupt me with questions as we go. So the talk is institutionalizing FreeBSD isolated and virtualized hosts using BSD install ZFS, ZFS up north, and NFSD. And you can find me on Twitter. It's an interesting place. And so moving, oh, wait, my black backgrounds are still <laughs> ghosts in the machine. Excuse me for just a moment. Oh, LibreOffice is not treating me well. Properties, colors, oh, there it is. Yes, that is the hope. Oh, they, they look great here. They look perfect on screen. Uh, it's presenting them that does funny, funny things to them. So, yep. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, you don't want to present slides, right? That isn't why you made them. Properties. Down the gradient. Okay, great. So I don't want to go through all of them. How do I apply to all? Be good. Oh, bollocks. Okay. Uh, fine. Settings. I regret doing this, but we get to look at my display. But it does have some cool toys in back. So we're not desktop. Yeah, I know. I'm going to synchronize the displays, and you get to see more than you bargained for. Yeah, I want to read my email. You can do all kinds of cool stuff. So if I do... <laughs> looks good, and then it does that. But it looks good without that. So uh, I regret to do this, but such is life. Oh, bad, 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 bad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Grumble. Why, why did I lose resolution? Seriously? Well, you get to see what I see. And I'll zoom out a tad, and I apologize for that. Okay. Semi-visible. It is dog-fooded. <laughs> so... Always an adventure, and it allows me to move even quicker. So the topic is institutionalizing FreeBSD isolated and virtualized hosts using a number of technologies that are in FreeBSD, but this talk does not apply to all of them. But, oh, quite a few years on, jail arrived in 2000, and so 18 years on, the built-in isolation tool jail in FreeBSD and the Beehive hypervisor that's been there oh, over five years are still a bit of the odd ducks in the system. And the question is, why are they still strangers after all this time? So breaking this down, institutionalized, integrated as first-class features. And uh, FreeBSD is an example here, but that is not the only way to use some of these techniques. I'll try and get rid of some little menus here, if I can. And isolated and virtualized, specifically jails and Beehive, which one of which provides an ABI interface so that applications can be contained in very, to various degrees of success. And for the other, an instruction set architecture like Intel architecture on Intel can be provided to guests. <clears throat> and then these tools, one of which is the FreeBSD installer, uh, the, is the ZFS file system, and the in-kernel FreeBSD NFSD, the network uh, file system that is rather performant being in kernel. So, motivations, all that virtualization stuff, be it Docker, zones, droplets, containers, it's, it's hot stuff, people want it. 
Um, and they all achieve it in various ways. And hopefully they're happy users. Are there any users in the audience that are using some form of containment mechanism, virtualization, or hope to hear about some today? Cool. Uh, but have. Cool. So it raises the question, are we contained yet? Are applications adequately isolated? Uh, do we have nice features that apply to virtual machines once they're contained, like atomic snapshotting? Are dependencies resolved? Do we have nifty things like overlay file systems? And all these nifty things that often the OS provides. And when the commercial virtualization provider provides them, your mileage may vary. So I think OSs are actually a great thing. And my exact motivations are initially when I discovered jail, that was in response to the classic RPM hell on Red Hat systems in the late 90s. I was in a Red Hat town, and that's what people use. And they said, here's, you know, here's the open source free software Unix equivalent. And so I, I suspect many of you have walked into that where once you apply software to your system, there's very little chance you'll get it out completely. But if you contain it, you have the opportunity to remove the entire container in one fell swoop. And uh, moving on to the motivations for Beehive, for me, it's interesting to run foreign OSs. The original producer of Beehive used it to support acquisitions on their product. You acquire a company with their technology, you can port it for six to 12 months, or you can drop it in a VM over the weekend. So that's been very effective for various folks. And in general, to isolate and diversify. Now, this whole notion of containment arguably landed with Cheroot back in 79. They used it for the uh, packaging of the operating system. But then someone realized, well, what if we just didn't allow applications to poke their heads out of it? We might have some unique opportunities. That was some time ago. And perhaps you've heard of Popek and Goldberg, the, the folks who literally wrote the book on virtualization and categorized the type 1, type 2 hypervisors on and on back in 74. I was too. A lot of time has passed while we've had all these ideas and technologies, but it's taken quite a while for actual free software ones to land and be useful to all of us. So again, are we isolated yet with all these ideas and such? Now, more to the point on motivations. Drop everything, test everything, please. This has come up in various ways at this conference, and I want to hear it come up a lot. Stuff breaks, breaks too often, test the living heck out of it. And I found that uh, when you are navigating a operating system's history and various commits that work, commits that don't, you need to be able to get it as fine-grained as possible in isolated environments, because if it builds on my box and doesn't build on your box, it's not helpful to anyone. Docker, to their credit, has made some good progress here, where it's like, here's our Docker image, pass it around among all the dev team folks and run with it. Well, we have much of that functionality already at the operating system level. So on one level, there is there the regressions I personally have been facing commercially. And there's what I call, and is defined as paleophobia, the fear of old things, the fear of the past, the fear of everything earlier than the most recent commit to the development branch of your operating system. So that can mean software breaking. And in rapid churn, there is the opportunity for breakage. And when there's a fast-moving river, uh, regressions can get lost in that river. And I'll go into two examples that uh, really bit me personally. So for me, and historically, 2003, going from jails to get out of RPM hell. 2011, Beehive came along at BSD CAM. They gave a presentation. A few months later, someone, myself, said, hey, that was cool. Can I try it? I don't know why no one else did. Uh, better late than never. And recently, I've been chasing regressions with it. But now, simultaneously chasing OpenZFS with the hypervisor. And I'll get to that. So a, tale, a quick tale of two regressions. Number one, this, this is specific to the FreeBSD tree, but I'm sure something like it can happen in any software, proprietary or, or open or otherwise. A memory leak in ZFS. Now. The bug was introduced in June of 2017. It was fixed in October of 2017, 3,710 commits later, three months later. Now, that's pretty quick, and it was in the development branch. Some folks think that development branches are a wild west place to 
experiment. Some think they should be arguably more stable than uh, stable is the name they used because, hey, uh, we're committing code that we want to future use. So that's a, mm -hmm, a motivator. Uh, this trickled out into, whoops, it trickled out into uh, free NAS. Right or wrong, it trickled out. So a bug that was in the devel development branch trickled out into a product shipped to users. And uh, that took till January of the next year to be fixed. And so out in the wild, we had three months in development areas. We had 36 days in the public with a quote unquote release. And with a memory leak, a storage box will just start filling up all available RAM, which is aggravated by ZF ZFS, which is very memory intensive. It starts killing processes and then tips over and reboots. So um, that's bad. Number two, uh, the pathologic case of Teldir for Samba. Now, this change, which was a POSIX compliant fix for libc, made it in July 2014 into the tree in the development branch, and was fixed in April of 2017, 81,000 plus commits later, three years later. Now, everything was fine in that regard there on up. The bug arrived. Two releases arrived. The previous OS was end of life. It was resolved in 2017 and later resolved in FreeNAS, drawing from, from FreeBSD. Now, let's call it the regression gap. <laughs> uh, seven months off the radar in like a, a production operating system. It took me nine months to chase down this bug. And a key thing happened. The place where it was introduced was end of life, and we moved on to development branches down the road from it. So. I've heard quotations like, oh, any effort spent in the past with anything just like old and of life is current development. It's like, okay, there's some truth in that. But the moment a regression is end of life, it becomes default behavior and infinitely more difficult to locate. That's me yakking away. And so let's find a healthy medium and have a little paleophobia counseling. Don't fear the past. <laughs> Embrace it. Your whole history is there. So it should be easy to navigate the past. And there's some very cool things in the past, like this Corvette. So uh, rephrase, I wouldn't be looking for regressions in the past if you didn't hide them there. So the past is very important to what I'm working on currently. And in the fond words of the BC boys, it's sabotage when you create a regression, a regression in an operating system and break it for everybody, because it was working the day before. Ouch. So who remembers the 25-year-old bug in, in BSD reported on Slashdot a zillion million years ago, which was May 2008, 25-year-old bug, which gives us a little context. FreeBSD arrived in 93. Unix moved to the C programming langu language in 73. And we have a window of, oh, potentially 25 years for specifically FreeBSD, or 45 years, including from where it came. That's a pretty big, scary window. So hypervisors to the rescue, incorporate them into your development and testing. Did years ago, if you're developing anything on FreeBSD, and now let's say OpenBSD, you'll probably do it in Beehive, MM on OpenBSD. You have a prototype system at your fingertips, or a hundred like it, and things like ZFS can snapshot them. It's a good thing. Embrace them. So my VBSD con talk on isolated build environments touches on a little more of that in depth. So. What is FreeBSD? It's a permissively licensed Unix-like operating system, as are all the other BSDs. That's a good thing. In this context, and I think I lost my mask slides, uh, it is packaged up in simple ways. Uh, hey, I think I lost my mask. So, yeah, okay. Um, ba -ba -ba. It is packaged up in handy ways. Um, a tarball, which hasn't changed in decades, which is extracted to a destination, which is all quite straightforward. Let me try and make this a little more user friendly. Come on. This way. Go, come on. Come on. Computers, thank you. Oh, I lose my vision of it. Great. Um, anyway, let's see if it'll behave. So, in the FreeBSD content, context, driven from a developer's perspective and release engineer's perspective, just tarballs of stuff that gets dropped into a prepared file system 
and built from sources above all that, and the whole cycle continues. It's actually a really simple, elegant system that's gone on for years. And in the course of all that, for my concerns, FreeBSD itself rearranged the kernel to a location called boot kernel back in 5.0, and that hasn't changed since. And that happens to boot in Beehive through certain roundabout ways, such that one gets hypervisor access to back to 5.0 and when was that, 2003? So once that's made effortless, one can uh, jump through history. 2005? <laughs> okay. Uh, one can dance through, hi through history effortlessly. And when I mentioned, hey, tarballs get extracted to file systems, one can repackage up old tarballs and slam them into the current installer and install a 15 0 decade plus old operating system using current tools. Because it's Unix, certain stuff doesn't change very often. And the installer arrived in 9.0, so what? It's just a point in history. So in all that, some habits must change. We must just decouple installation from the versions of the installer. The idea that you install OpenBSD version foo to the same version. The installer is one OS version, the destination is that, and they're, they're lockstep. That's not helpful when you want to fly through decades of history. So. I'll get to how that can be done in FreeBSD and decouple the installation from new hardware. We all have the, the new box where you get the box, you stick in your 2079 Windows 10 floppies, and it's your installation. Well, when it's a virtual environment, you may spin up a dozen virtual machines and a dozen more. And having all installers tied to this model, this here, this old lovely PC, is not helpful. So let's talk the time machine here. My quick check showed 5.0 in 2008, 7 arrived in 2008. Uh, back in 2003, we got the modern layout for the file system. And in uh, a, a little later, a little easier uh, customization. And for whatever reason, LibreOffice is also not showing my masked out slides. Awesome. So, to take the current installer that arrived in 9.0 and make it more friendly to like decoupling from that old PC where you have a stack of floppies and you just install to a single device, um, I have a, a proof of concept to avoid name collisions. Uh, by default, FreeBSD gives you zroot. So if you have a dozen machines, they're all zroot as the boot zpool. So not ideal. Um, the first thing the installer does is unmount all zpools. Well, that's not good if you're on a, an operating host as opposed to install CD-ROM or Memstick or otherwise. Occasionally, you want to keep that new machine mounted for further customization, even booting right then and there as opposed to reboot the hardware. And when you uh, separate the versioning of the host that you're installing from in the destination, suddenly things like boot blocks need to be aware of the fact that you're shifting forward in, or past in time. And if you caught Ingo's talk, I brought up uh, C++ specifically because Dialog is written in C++. It's a GNU license library for, that's used in FreeBSD, specifically in the installer, and I'm not sure where else, but a few spots. But uh, eventually, various folks would like to get the GPL dependencies out of the operating system. And also, uh, there's a notion of nested boot environments. Quick show of hands, who's familiar with ZFS at all? Okay, most to some degree. Um, boot environments, check it out. It destroys dual booting. Remember the good old days, like Lilo, point it at Windows 90 something, and a Linux distro and a BSD distro, and pray. Uh, boot environments institutionally have a, a root within a storage pool, and you can choose it at boot time, allowing for the Zpool, and often does thus one system. So, pros about the installer, it's largely been SH. Uh, it uses the C programming language for UFS support. That's cool, I, I have no major problem with that, although it's a lot faster to prototype in SH. And it supports a wide range of partitioning schemes, which is a very good thing in this modern world. UFS, uh, UFS and ZFS on, say, MBR and GPT, et cetera, et cetera. It has an extremely primitive sense of installing to a jail. 
I've never known anyone to use it, but it supports FreeBSD 5.0 onward thanks to uh, a small repackaging of just the existing binary distribution sets. So a few cons about the current installer. It assumes a fresh installation, a big old machine in front of you, a stack of disks or one disk or a memory stick or whatever, and moves on to think that they're synchronized versions. It relies on a tool that they'd like to get out of there. It, BSD install itself depends on BSD config. The C base components aren't uh, super transparent to those who are familiar, say, with more scripted languages. And given that you're calling entirely user land commands, it's, it's perhaps an unnecessary burden. I don't know. It's subjective. And from a development perspective, it traps exits when you are writing shell code and you want to check your variables and just exit. It loops infinitum, and that is stunningly frustrating. So a thing about boot environments, traditionally you have, uh, I'll go with the defaults here from FreeBSD, Z root root default is like your default in installation of your operating system. And typically below that are in the same column, shared user, shared var, shared other directories. A nested boot environment is all of those within, within and below that top mount point so that they can be completely isolated between different installations of an OS into a boot environment. Now, I would like to see, given that Illumos uses the FreeBSD loader, a boot environment that is Illumos, be it uh, smart OS, be it uh, open Indiana, coexisting on a zpool with FreeBSD. Why not? Or, as I'll show in a moment, NetBSD, which has just stepped its toe into the ZFS world. So a little coexistence would be a nice thing. Uh, I believe it was FreeBSD 11.1 implemented the ZFSBE RC script, which says, hey, it looks like you have a nested boot environment. Let's mount all those missing pieces so you don't just end up with a pretty empty top-level root directory. So it, all the code to do the handling of such things is right there. And so I pulled that in, and then for a very long time, sysinstall, perhaps from day one, has supported scripting. And I've added a few flags to support things like boot blocks from the, from the disk set, uh, nested data sets, and fit within the current system, such that it's not too unfamiliar. And as a bonus, once you step back and think about, I have all these tools at my disposal, even under the current installation of FreeBSD, you can aim the hypervisor at your new installation before you reboot. It's right there. They're, they're, the tools are there to help you. The installer should perhaps institutionally say, hey, do you want to dry run boot this OS? Yes, it has, will have different hardware from the host OS, but some notion of success can be verified with an in-base tool, which is a nice thing. But once you start thinking about scripting, those can be scripted in a larger context, which is for where it gets interesting to me. So just that, that first step, tinkering with BSD install, uh, suddenly we can use its own syntax to generate block devices, uh, MD, or aim it at real hardware devices. I suppose you can pass in uh, memory back disks, RAM disks, or, or just disk images. And it's all in base. Moving on, if you have this in-base tools with like a tiny diff of what's already there, perhaps manage it with a VM tab, virtual machine tab, to go along with the jail tab and the jail tools and uh, your FS tab and just manage it with an RC script as one does in Unix. And arguably institutionalized. And as I touched on, you can run it with uh, VM run SH, but not so fast. In this context, the hypervisor currently supports Back to FreeBSD 8.4, back when AHCI was introduced. That's just what's in there. There is a project for uh, IDE emulation, but that is not currently working. It gives a much shorter regression window, a good one, but a shorter one. And block devices are great, and they run the world, but it's also nice to work within file-backed environments. And it raises a question about other OS ports. So in general, I love ZFS, I love boot environments, I love BSD Unix. I'm motivated to push these tools. So about ZFS, it's a great storage platform. In general, it's becoming remarkably cross-platform remarkably quickly. And my personal motivation is to test every supported ZFS environment. Um, but 
only proprietary operating systems care where they boot from. <laughs> that is, you start tying your Windows license to your CPU number of cores and packages and then to this disk and then there's a point there where it would just warn you that you've changed your hardware and oh my gosh, you're violating some rule that even though you paid for everything. So once you start decoupling from artificial restraints like that, you start becoming a lot less limited. So the thing, let, let me show you the thing, which is one small advantage of this thing weirding out and such, but this is NetBSD under a Beehive virtual machine running ZFS, which received an update like a week ago. So it is now in the snapshots of NetBSD. Are there any NetBSD users in the room? Anyone? Anyone? Oh, well, Alistair, of course. Yes, sir. Member of the board. Well, uh, how do you receive this news? Excellent. Okay, cool. <laughs> Directly from Alistair Cooks. Um, it's the real thing, and it's drawing from FreeBSD as an upstream provider, which is an interesting uh, historic moment where, well, FreeBSD has been at the mercy of Illumos as an upstream provider, and they've done much work to make it BSD friendly. Well, they are coattailing. Do it, please, coattail the hell out of it. So it's a zpool trinity. Does anyone get the joke? Anyone? So you'll see all these examples of tank in the Z Z ZFS documentation from the movie The Matrix. It's not a tank of water and a pool and all that stuff. It's from the movie. So you see Dozer in some examples and you're Trinity, damn it. So moving on, where's my VNC? Are you still here? Oh, it went to sleep. Wake up, wake up. Here we go. Ah, so Windows 10 may build with open ZFS for Windows. Jorgen, the developer who produced it on Mac, which I've been using reliably for several years, is tinkering with Windows and blew people's minds at the October Open ZFS Developer Summit in San Francisco. Please do come to the next one. It's a great event. It is rough around the edges, but it is real ZFS booting on real Windows. And in this case, it's booting from, uh, being a ThinkPad, an Ultra Bay drive with Windows on it and using my mSATA hardware device as its pool device. So this is all hardware backed. I can reboot the machine into it natively off hardware. So uh, back to that decoupling, lots of cool things happen once you just step back and look at how all these parts can relate to one another. There are a few billion users who shouldn't be using NTFS. They are forced to. It has some advantages, but uh, you, you combat ransomware on Windows with ZFS. That's just what you do, be it with iSCSI, be it with a, a share over the network. So uh, I am in no way harshing on Windows. I think it's, it's an opportunity. Uh, there was various talk today about how you know, people poop on other operating systems. I'm, I've run more Windows in the last two weeks than I have in my entire life, but, but watch this space. That is quite exciting. So. With all that in mind, I've pushed the installer around within the confines, within the operating system. Yeah, a few long nights over the, the holidays last fall, last winter. So in wanting to just have more reach over time and otherwise, I propose network boot environments, networked boot environments. So what? Unix has supported root on NFS from the day NFS arrived within Sun, who seems to be providing all these technologies, which stands for Stanford University Network, which ironically comes out of Berkeley. Hello. Quite the lineage there. So Unix has done that longer than all these cool things. NVMe is great, but it's a recent phenomena. And SATA AHCI, a recent phenomena. Uh, IDE is relatively recent when you look at the Unix history. So. Well, let's, let's step back and consider this. ZFS from day, probably day one or late in the, bef before it hit the public, uh, has had share NFS as a property where you just take a data set and share it over NFS with a few parameters. Well, on FreeBSD, it's, it's fragile. Don't go there, but hopefully that will get resolved. But that doesn't change the underlying tools. But let's see, mount your, head, which would I'll call, you know, development branch of FreeBSD, boot environment, to which I can hardware boot, mount it. 
from there, you can cheroot into it if you just need to say hello and do something. You can jail it if you want some amount of meaningful boot of that environment in an isolated environment. Or you can export it over NFS, quite literally drop it into your exports. And when you do that, there's a little housekeeping that needs to happen. Uh, the loader, although there was a GBLOCK project that never happened, the loader, was, Beehive load was going to support Pixie booting. Well, to get the approximate of NFS booting without PXE and friends, uh, one needs to do a little housekeeping that, will, that can be automated with the utility. Thank you, Marius, for that. And housekeeping at the receiving end, where the FS tab needs to know that it's, it's other, uh, blah, 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 other traditionally slices like user, mail, log temp, etc., happen to be over NFS shares. One point about NFS on ZFS. When they say it's a file system, it's a file system with individual unique inode numbers. You'll be very frustrated if you try to share the very top level of a deep nested set of data sets. That will bite you in the behind, just be aware of that. So, but that's hard. Well, I've done the work to make that all happen. That took gee, a few days. And let's see what we can do with that in place. Bare metal, well, it's, it's a boot environment on my machine right there. You just aim at it and boot bare metal if you want. You can mount and contain it with Chiroot and Jail, or contain with Chiroot, boot with Jail. You can boot it once exported with Beehive Load with a few NFS parameters to say, hey, here's where your root is coming from, like we've done for decades in Unix. You can add to that TFTP and DHCBD. And within that, you can boot under Beehive UEFI GOP, which has a Pixie daemon inside of it and can perform all the steps on a local machine internally with PXE. Zen can do the same. Zen is just pulling off of all the goodies that QEMU can do. And Zen is now in FreeBSD. But it's an NFS share of a boot environment. And you can wake on LAN a machine across the room and just say, hey, go boot from here. So it's one boot environment containing one OS, one specific version, that can go a lot of places. Oh, the places you'll go. Patrick, you look. Cool, yeah. So. <laughs> I can hardware boot my machine. I can prototype it. I can make it to my liking. I can then network boot another machine from that boot environment. Uh, I could clone it a bunch of times for every machine in the room and just say, okay, we all net boot to this for the class. You know, here in the classroom, uh, let's just then do our work, shut down our machines, and just move on. So it was eye opening for me. <laughs> And so, oh, the places you'll go. And with file-backed virtual machines, this is a, just a directory such that if you're running tests on a, a, any location in this, be it a, a local virtual machine or a remote one, like doing your number crunching on a Xeon box across the room, file level so the host can go take a look at what's doing. You can have Sentinel files saying, hey, I've completed this test. Oh, I've, not, I've borked. I've done whatever. It's just it's, it's full transparency. There is Plan 9 FS, which was thrust upon the world in FreeNAS 10, and was by no means ready for use by the world. It is a nifty block, pseudo block level file level system. So you get that transparency on like a hardware boot. Don't go there. Didn't work. Maybe it will someday. But moving on, with that in mind, uh, let's do another proof of concept, BE. Alan Jude, as per the shirt, said, oh yeah, he's got his face on the tech snap shirts and said, you know, use the ZFS syntax, duh, and buy my book. He's a nice guy. So I loosely followed ZFS syntax with a little utility that manages all this. Let's do BE boot environment create dash L layout free BSD, which is all the standard direct data sets for FreeBSD with a name, mount it, install with an, an AMD64 operating system with release 11.1 1 into that data set because it's taking care of all the housekeeping to work on a data set that can be mounted behind the scenes. Share it over NFS, boot it over NFS, although the boot command will, will call the share command. Share PXE to 
add on top of all that the pixie goodies to allow for, be it the UHI GOP, pseudo BIOS, although Tyana Cori is the BIOS and it's available in user space with that. Uh, shared over Pixie, booted over Pixie, or wake on LAN a specific MAC address and just say, hey, I've created this thing in like two commands, aim at it. Now, uh, a flat layout of just a directory, no user directory, no crash dump directory. Share it over NFS, whoops, I created a ZFS aware NAS in two commands. Just, there it is, it's, it'll splat out data like the original ZFS share NFS command. So moving on, it's an in-kernel NFSD competing with an on-disk checksumming file system. My initial tests were remarkably fast. On a local machine over a network, you're bound by the network, but that's no surprise. So NFS, it has its issues, many of which have been resolved in various ways. The joke is, oh, not a file system. Uh, anyone experiment with quote unquote databases on NFS, even like the SQLite in package and such, it doesn't like NFS and there are various workarounds to attending to that. It, it thinks, what is this? And all my F-Sync operations are a bit strange. Uh, it's sometimes related to locking. FreeBSD 6 introduced a notion of diskless where you actually have almost a, a zipped archives of directories that get mounted such that you can read write to them under standard uh, file syntax and then close them all up when you finish up. So that's institutionalized, institutionally resolved, but it's an added layer of complexity. So in talking to some various OpenBSD folks online, it's like they did an audit of OpenBSD from say read-only file systems or file systems that change from read-only to read write and back again. And I'd say some auditing is needed in anything that's Unix-like to explore how it behaves on read-write file systems, on NFS file systems, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a to-do item if anyone's interested. But within this context of uh, going through time, uh, FreeBSD 8.4, DidVert IO, AHCI, and 8.0, uh, E1000 Intel driver, there is an NE2000 network driver that supports Beehive with, uh, I believe 5.0 and 5.1, but ATA did not happen. A block device utility to simply aim at some devices and human readably with a few commands uh, set up block storage is a good thing. So we've done block devices with the old classic system I have my own VMRC to manage those. A file level, level OS works as an installer with the simple command that manages virtual machines, but may as well point at a hardware disk that you will boot your laptop from or a virtual machine that's far, far away. We bump into philosophical challenges that I hear at every conference. So let's run through some of them. So, oh no, bin SH, oh gosh, you can't do that. So you have to do it in all these other languages. Pick your favorite. I am of the opinion on that one that let the file system and the hypervisor do the heavy lifting. Have a small shim in between that lets them talk and get the hell out of the way and let them do their thing. So things like uh, dispatchers and fancy layers and layers uh, concern me. Uh, OSH said in awk, they are throughout the system. So FreeBSD, perhaps not other operating systems, have been forklift upgrading their installers. Like, oh, we have sysinstall throw it all out and recreate some of its functionality in a new thing. Had they embraced the simple tools, dare I say a bit like OpenBSD, you might have the same shell-based installer, which can have various ways to give you pretty pictures, but shell behind the scenes, we could have 20 years plus of refining that tool rather than throwing it out every decade or two, which I think is a disservice to everyone involved because rewriting means rewriting. And the basic principles haven't changed in decades, but anyway. Forklift upgrades, frustrating, and with such a tool, and as I go back in time, I'm as concerned about installing FreeBSD 1.0 as I am as to 12 current. To me, it's a bunch of tar built, tar balls of binaries that get put in a place, a file system, be it network or, or hardware backed. That's just agnostic. And of course, they are run control scripts for a reason. These come up in various ways. Uh, that's how. Unix has traditionally worked. The keynote 
addresses how there are alternatives. I have no problem with things changing under the hood, but to the user, that's what's familiar. And so, <laughs> also in the course of this and a great many conferences, my seven years of lucky user feedback. This is my favorite. Please identify if you're in one of these categories. The network engineer, engineer. I need infinitely configurable networking, but please make the storage and, and uh, applications brain dead simple. And if you talk to a storage engineer, they want maximum control. The first one wants like two dozen VLANs and goodies. The second one wants a block size control over all the data sets provided to different applications because, hey, they have their different requirements and optimization, blah, blah, blah. But, but, but they want the networking and application to be brain dead simple. And you talk to the application developer, the DevOps folks, they just want the storage and networking to show up. And they want the applications to be fine grained, tunable, be it a hundred Docker instances to choose from or you name it. Is anyone guilty of falling into one of these categories? I see a hand go up. Which category are you in? Uh, probably the top two categories. In the top two? Okay. So apps just should show up. Cool. And this gets to the whole idea of what, how do you manage a hypervisor or plus a file system when they're both really powerful. And here's a graphic display of, of that situation with the three bears where you have the knee of one and the other two go up. Yeah. So <clears throat> Ingo, you, if you caught the last talk in this room, it was great about same defaults and overrides. He, I think you touched on that. You're nodding. Okay. You will not satisfy any, well, all users right off the bat by choosing, say, a fixed swap size on the installation. <laughs> you can calculate it maybe based on RAM, but there is a user that will not need what you decided is a default. Well, have the best default you can think of and allow it to be easily overridden. That works. That's worked very well for a very long time. The, the build system does it quite well. And let's not lose that ability. It's, it's a disservice to do so. So another related point, configuration files are great, but on a, a, a read-only mounted system, you can't write a config file for a virtual box and slam it in there. You, what, a, a memory back temp FS maybe? Kind of put it there. I don't know if you could link it to VirtualBox or convince VirtualBox to look there. Maybe VirtualBox has a flag to go look at your specific location, but not the parameters there. So things like arguments passed into a, a binary are still a really good thing. And yes, they might get long, but that's where you hide them for the user and such. So VM run SH, which I mentioned is the in-base FreeBSD Beehive utility, allows you to, say, boot your fresh installation that you've booted from a CD-ROM on. Embrace that. So all that said, eyes on the prize. Uh, I've been talking about this for some time. LibreOffice insists on giving you my slides that I've masked out. In bringing all these parts together, all the tools, hands-on multiplicity, Beehive came along. Visualizing all that with graphical tools and Devin Teske's vtrace based talk today was fantastic in that regard. Uh, various blocks, uh, block of uh, options in block storage on FreeBSD, which is the geom layer with overlay file systems and replicated uh, blocks with, say, Hast and other cool stuff is, is a nice talk. Uh, smart utility, because when everything terminates with these stupid hard disks, it's good to know what they're up to. Uh, BeehiveCon, I hope some of you attended that. Do come on, and that's where you can find a bit more. But I'm chasing regressions. That's really what's motivating me among all these cool things, such that when you work with this sort of classic scripted environment, everything here I picture in a shell loop stepping through, if necessary, single stepping source commits. Just step back and let it do that while I sleep. I don't, and I've tried this, you sit down and you think you know where the regression might be, you literally take hardware, you install to it, and 20 minutes later you run your test and you hopefully got the right version. And typically it's a release that you're installing to hardware such that one has to step back, contain it, and rip through it with familiar tools like shell scripts. So in this regression testing, uh, I hope to step through, hey, as we go through history, are we improving on man page count or decreasing and, and stepping back? And 
what release will build a previous release and past release. You try to drop FreeBSD 5 on 12, and it probably won't build. But there are closer versions that will do that. And eventually, worst case, bisecting and finding swaths of commits to go find a regression in, ideally while I sleep. So more housekeeping. I'm work with se working with several people to reconstruct FreeBSD's FTP archive, which is just old releases. You'd think that would be just a solved problem, but no. There are a great many that are missing. They are well documented to have existed, but people just didn't keep stuff around the way they can, important part, can now, now that space is so much more plentiful. I've repackaged FreeBSD 5.0 onward to work with a modern installer. Uh, makes it effortless to just aim at new machines pulled out of thin air. Definitely a need for a read-write NFS audit. I've done 90% of what's called a source.conf. Uh, build configuration audit, and I assume every modern BSD has this in some regard. You say, and Jason, thank you for helping with that. <laughs> uh, I don't want to build send mail. You just have a flag that says, I don't want to build send mail. Well, they're broken. They're often broken, and developers have been lazy about just verifying that if they add something to the tree, that it can be removed from the tree. So, in the context of package base, and this last 48 hours, I have heard of four unique efforts to package base in FreeBSD, which is to break up the base operating system into RPMs, a bit, or RPM style packages using the package architecture and infrastructure. Um, that gets exciting because when you're building virtual machines, say hundreds of them, you don't want typically a Clang compiler, as just came up in the last talk about how big that thing is. And the, custom-made virtual machine generally is purpose-built such that you don't need a compiler. So all very exciting things in virtual context and all steps towards institutionalizing this. But seriously, why are you doing this? I know you might think I'm crazy for going through history, but you strip the installer and can literally drop it in a shell script as opposed to sit at a hardware machine and push buttons. You completely separate hardware and software hosts. I'm running Windows 10 right in front of you, but I can also boot the hardware to it. We can isolate as appropriate. If you just need to pop into a system and set a config file within its context, just shrewd into it, do it. Uh, two hypervisors are available in FreeBSD as per the tradition. Three firewalls, two hypervisors, you name it. <laughs> lots of them, lots of file systems. One in OpenBSD. We'll see what NetBSD does. Alistair, any ideas? Uh, he's, he's working, but <laughs> I'll grill you about what. Is NetBSD looking at any hypervisors? You had Zen from early, early on, correct? Yeah, we had Zen from. Is that getting good love? Yeah. It's up to date? Oh, yeah. oh great, because there were times NetBSD Zen lagged, but if it's up to date, super. I'd argue it's a best kept secret, but just saying. So a configurable, malleable, reducible user land through either package base or source.conf, we get to all this Dockery stuff using in-base tools. Literally a few hundred lines of shell script to make all this happen delivers much of what people are all excited about and throwing money at and venture capital at with in-base tools, such that I would argue that is institutionalized and isolated virtualized host. And that's how a one promising proof of concept how to do it. I very much welcome your input on how to do it. Now, it raises a question. Finally, does this container movement represent true, genuine flaws in the Unix computing model? I mean, Docker is here because Unix gets it wrong. Or is it a misunderstanding of the Unix computing model? On that note, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, it was a bit of a fire hose, but uh, yeah. Any questions? And I'll bring up the toy. Here's Windows with ZFS to point out where this is all headed now that once you have an open source environment and you can drop a file system on the least likely destination, do it. Yes, sir. I would argue that the, the value that Docker brings is the developer experience and their desktop that can work on Windows or OS or OS X or whatever. How do you see, um, how do you see using boot environments or ZFS in that context? I'm arguing, or I'm wondering if, if 
there's a if there's a if there's a more um, universal interface that uh, doesn't look like Docker but is in Kubernetes. Okay. So <clears throat> the question is uh, when one of Docker's greatest strengths is that you have the unified interface brought to every developer, regardless of size, some of their platform, it brings them on the same page. With some irony, we flip that over and we can run most of those environments, be it Windows 10, which is running here, or you know, the OpenBSD folks can have their OpenBSD VM and the FreeBSD folks. It's not for everybody, but we can provide that. Some folks will say just use VDI. You can ship those. <laughs> them to each user, but of course they want to be road warriors on the plane doing their thing. Uh, Beehive has shown up in OS 10 as, as Xhive. It's dead. It's dead? Yeah. Oh, I just had it. I heard of it come up today, but that's good to know. He's good. Okay. Xhive dead. Uh, let's have that conversation in the hallway. Now, when I was tinkering, tinkering with uh, Windows 10, Fortunately, my ThinkPad has a pro license. So I just found the command to free a disk, the hardware disk from management by the OS. I pointed Hyper-V at it and had my FreeBSD disk launch under Windows 10. And I'm doing the exact opposite as needed, such that if those developers can go with a, well, if they have some form of hypervisor, yes, and isn't, it, to what degree is Docker doing that in 2018? I know they've changed their model a few times of with hypervisor without XHive was driven by them to do that. So that's my experience of it. How are you doing it? Yeah. Um, on what OS? I'm, 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 I'm just trying to learn how. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm doing that on Linux and I want to stop. You, you're doing it on Linux and want to stop with a hypervisor? Uh, okay. So just bare metal Linux. What's your number one pain point? Uh, for example, um, lack of introspection. Being able to determine the root cause of a crash and instead, and so we're doing it shop. Okay. Just get rescheduled and I don't know why. Okay. I'm going all day. I can go 10, year, 10 more years on this. <laughs> 340. And until when? I'll keep up the, the time frame within. To that I say, uh, ZFS is great, the instant rollback, be it to mitigate crypt to ransomware or to go back to your previous build because, wow, we sure got that one wrong. It's just instantly return in time, no recopying files, no redeploying, just back, the back button. <laughs> uh, that plus, please watch online Devin Teske's talk on DTrace and DWatch, her own tool. Well, uh, who's heard of Gorse? It's used to track source commits and she used it to produce a video for 25 years of FreeBSD where uh, she tracked all of the commits visually. Just here's NetBSD spinning off from wherever and OpenBSD spinning off of it. It's, it's beautiful. It's 25 years crammed into like five minutes. Now, uh, she has it real time from a remote system feeding back the DTrace data and saying, okay, let's just watch the disk activity when we launch our thing or build our thing. And there's like uh, single-threaded build world and multi-thread, and let's just watch them go. And uh, those two tools alone give you introspection, like X-ray vision. So, as for putting it on the laps of all your developers, uh, drop them into a virtual machine. The notion of FreeBSD and ZFS working on on NTFS seems to defeat the purpose. But I'm pointing at my MSATA drive. It's hardware storage provided to ZFS in Windows on FreeBSD. So I'd argue, yes, I'm trying to just chop all that up and put it back together in whatever order you want. And from a developer's perspective, hopefully there's an order that suits you well. Sure. <laughs> Others. Je Jason? Philip? Patrick? Questions? And tomorrow, that's easy to find. Thank you.